Hello world, this is Eric Knowles coming at you again from somewhere in the Chiltern Hills. Now, having given uh, six talks relating to Rini Lalique, I'm now embarking on two, if not three, more talks, which are going to be looking at the work of William Moorcroft, taking into account Walter Moorcroft, and um, if we can, we'll be looking at what I call the Phoenix Years, which will relate to the past 30-something years. Yes, the company is still up and operating and um, is uh, very much in need of uh, lots of support from the collectors at the moment in these very difficult times. But having said that, just to remind you uh, uh, about uh, the aim of these talks, because um, the aim is primarily to raise some funds that can be sent on to the British Red Cross, who in turn will um, send them on to fight the COVID-19 virus. So we are looking for donations. Um, it doesn't matter how much, how little, whatever. Um, it's just fair to say that whatever you can will be gratefully received. Um, more information at the end of the talk. And I'm up against it to start with because I'm told that when it comes to YouTube, you know, three minutes is about as much as you can expect from, you know, the average viewer's concentration. Well, I'd like to think that I'm attracting a sort of a, a higher level of uh, conscience here um, because uh, my previous talks have all lasted between 10 and 15 minutes. So if you're in for the short haul, switch off now. Uh, but if you are interested in Moorcroft pottery, well, let's start. And let's start by uh, uh, telling you that William Moorcroft was born in 1872. His father, Thomas Moorcroft, was a well-respected uh, ceramic designer and flower painter uh, working for the firm of EJD Bodley. Um, now, let me tell you that uh, certainly um, in 1895, um, William Moorcroft um, goes off to London and he goes off to the National Art Training School in South Kensington, which in later years became the Royal College of Art. And certainly uh, within two years, um, he acquires his um, um, art master's um, certificate, meaning he could teach uh, art in any school. But he decides he wants to go back to Burslem. He wants to work in the ceramic industry. And, um, and eventually um, he gets a job with the firm of James McIntyre's. But before 1890, let's go back to 1895, because in 1895, um, let's just tell you that um, the, that the high point of ceramic design is shown um, by this pair of vases. Now, these were made by Minton. Uh, they're in the technique as known as Pat's uh, Pat. Um, and it was all uh, the behest, really, of uh, Mark Louis Solon, who was invited to come over from, uh, from France, from Serve, um, and, um, and set up shop uh, with Minton, producing what most collectors believe to be the finest examples of any ceramic uh, object uh, made to this day. Um, but uh, McIntyre's, let me tell you, McIntyre's had been going since the early part of the 19th century, uh, certainly by 1895, they were, um, they were keen to venture into art pottery. Um, and they wanted to produce something um, akin to Minton Pats of Pat. Um, well, they called on the services of this man. And this man is Harry Barnard. Now, Harry Barnard uh, came up from London. He'd been working uh, for uh, Dalton's in Lambeth. Uh, he came on a two-year contract. And um, fair to say, he came up with some interesting designs. Um, but... There seems to have been a, a, a conflict of personalities uh, because um, he wasn't keen to renew his contract and went on to work for Wedgwood, where his career really did take off. But in the meantime, situation vacant. Uh, the McIntyre board are keen to uh, invite uh, somebody who probably st studied at the Burslem School of Art. And the Burslem School of Art cannot ever be underestimated. It gave us some of the greatest names in 20th century uh, ceramic design. Um, let's mention Clarice Cliff. Let's mention Susie Cooper. Um, Gordon Forsyth uh, was, uh, uh, was the head for some time there. And he was the big... Uh, the big cheese, if you want, uh, at Pilkington's Royal Lancastrian Pottery. But 
Uh, let's have a look at some of the work that was produced because um, our Mr. Barnard is wanting to make use of slip trailing. Now this is where you actually um, trace the design onto your part and then you follow that design um, almost like icing a cake um, and apply this liquid slip um, to the design. You let it dry um, and then uh, you paint in the colours in the bits in between. Uh, and uh, here's a, a slender vase, um, not the most inspiring, um, I have to say. I mean, attractive, but it's quite a safe design. Uh, Barnard did do some good work. Um, and if you look at this vase, um, which is to be found in uh, the Wedgwood Museum in Boston, if you've never been, do go. It is amazing. It is it, it, well, it is a nirvana if you're, if you're into, into Wedgwood ceramics, uh, an absolute must. Um, and this one is a little bit more elaborate, as you can see, with some piercing around the neck. Um, but um, it, 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 it's not a style that, that really uh, made an impact um, with the buyers at that time. So um, I, the, the situation vacant is taken up by... William Moorcroft, okay, and um, so he, he arrives in 1897. By 1898, he's made the uh, the head of the the art department there at uh, at McIntyre's, and um, here we uh, we see a, a photograph of William. Uh, I've got to admit that this one is a little bit later. Uh, this one dates to probably around about 1925, 1930, uh, but looking quite dapper. Uh, I think it's fair to say. So the early products um, that uh, are coming from um, the design studio of Mr. Moorcroft um, look like this. Three vases um, known as Aurelian ware. That's A-U-R-E-L-I-A-N, Aurelian ware. Now these actually date to around about 1897, 1898. Um, and you can see a certain influence here, I think, um, when it comes to um, one of the, the great uh, mentors of the time, of course, being William Morris. Um, and these designs sort of reflect those, those fabric designs that, uh, that Morris was producing at that time. And then um, another great influence um, is this man. This is Arthur Lazenby Liberty. And Liberty um, could see the merit in uh, more cross designs and eventually uh, Liberty and the Liberty family became fundamentally important to William Moorcross uh, rise and career. So producing um, a catalogue um, in 1901 um, for Yuletide gifts. I love that term Yuletide. Yuletide. Why, why, why can we say Merry Yuletide or well, we could say Merry Christmas as well, but whatever. I love that. It's something Old English about Yuletide. Um, but here we see um, some very elaborate um, slip trail uh, pieces. Um, I mean, it takes a year to train anybody to slip trail a vase. It's a very, very um, skilled business. And then following that, um, Burslem Ware is another one. This is, this is from the 1902 Yuletide catalogue, where there's a departure from the Florian designs as they were retailed by Liberty as. Um, and this was um, a, a design series called Burslem Ware. Uh, I think what is interesting about this uh, particular uh, section is, um, is the very fact that if you look at this pencil sketch, um, it actually has been uh, written on hotel newspaper, uh, newspaper, ho hotel stationery, um, the Euston Hotel, which is probably when um, our uh, William was wake waiting for a train to take him back up to Stoke-on-Trent sometime in around about 1902, 1903. And if we look very carefully at the, the vase in the centre, Bang, here comes uh, the piece itself. Well, very close to it anyway. Uh, a design which is featuring um, uh, trees in landscapes and tall trees as well. So it was a sign of what was to come. And, and here is a, a, a vase actually 
in a, a Florian type design, you can see uh, the top of the vase. I'm sorry, the, um, the image is not as sharp as I'd like it to be. But what is important is the fact that you can see the signature here. And the signature next to the printer stamp of uh, Florian Ware is that of William Moorcroft. Now that is very significant because the one thing that Arthur Lazenby Liberty did not approve of um, was um, any of his designers uh, prior to this um, had the rights to sign their work. So somehow William Moorcroft uh, manages to bypass that, uh, that dictum and, um, and from then on um, most of his works uh, are either signed in full or they're signed with initials. But that um, that being said, let's have a look at the, uh, the the next vase because I've actually gone back a little bit in time to 1899, and this was a design, a peacock feather design, which found great favour. It was shown uh, in New York by Tiffany's, um, and there was um, some mention in uh, in the local uh, newspaper, the New York Times, uh, about this vase and others uh, in the exhibition. And um, I think the, the comment was that, uh, that the, the, the actual artist's signature got more attention um, to the maker. Uh, but that didn't bother Liberty because, you know, if he's selling big time in America, that's good enough for them. And uh, let's have a look at the next one. And the next one is basically to say, if you don't want a single vase, then what about this for a selection? Um, and the wonderful thing about, about Moorcroft pottery, right from the word go, is that William Moorcroft is not only um, coming up with the design, he's coming up with the shapes, and he's coming up with this wonderful harmony um, and colour combinations that just seem to work. Maybe not for everybody. I mean, it's all in the eye of the beholder. But there isn't a vase in this selection that you're looking at that I would say no to in my Christmas stocking. Um, now, I'm not here to try and make you like Moorcroft or anything like that. I'm just here to show you what was being produced. Um, so let's move on and let's move on and let's look at another uh, piece that was made for Liberty & Co. And quite often the Liberty Pots do actually say made for Liberty & Co. Um, uh, printed on the base. And this is Flaminium Ware. Now, they're normally produced in a, in a very sort of... Um, almost like a kidney red colour um, and um, but depending on how long you fired it in the kiln depended apparently on, on the colour you got and this one is a very sort of sumptuous green um, example and here's a, a taking it to um, a high point dating from around about 1905 which is quite significant because this was made for the firm of Shreve & Co in San Francisco. Now in 1904 uh, William Moorcroft had won a gold medal at the St. Louis International Exhibition. So you know the chances are that somebody from Shreve had visited uh, the Moorcroft stand and placed an order uh, for uh, um, in this case uh, a tea, a tea kettle um, because the, the handle as you can see goes from one end to the other rather than a teapot. But um, what makes it that little bit more different is the fact that these pots, and here's a, here's a, um, a detail anyway, uh, these pots have had um, silver plating applied to them using a silver deposit process. It's an, an electrolytic process um, uh, that, um, that uh, basically um, offers a surface for the uh, the silver to adhere to and the longer the process goes on the thicker and on uh, and once you've got a certain thickness you can then engrave. Now this wasn't anything new to ceramics in America because anybody um, watching in America or anybody here who knows Rookwood pottery uh, from Cincinnati uh, will recognize that this was a feature that they often employed um, on on some of their, their art pots. Um, but um, it is very much, how can I say, it's premier division as far as collectors are concerned. Um, anything from Shreve & Co with silver plating will always attract um, big attention. And um, 
dare I say, big money. Uh, but let's have a look at a, a typical Liberty interior. Uh, because if you went to Liberties, you name it, your furniture, uh, your cutlery, your, your, your um, dare I say, your curtains, your fabrics, um, um, metalwork, and of course, pottery, uh, taking into account uh, that uh, Moorcroft was not the only um, uh, uh, potter uh, providing Moorcroft, uh, sorry, providing Liberty uh, with ceramics. Um, but it would be a little bit of a mistake to think that everybody in 1905 was demanding uh, an arts and crafts interior um, because arts and crafts wasn't for everybody um, and um, there, there were quite a few people who were quite happy with this type of furniture albeit a revivalist piece a, a Sheraton stroke Heppel White um, display cabinet um, yes a Georgian taste uh, seemed to find a revival in Edwardian England and he carried on through uh, throughout the uh, even the interwar years um, but what about the vase that we're looking at now? Now this shows, I think, a bit of a astute business acumen from William Moorcroft because uh, this vase is known as the 18th century pattern. Um, and the long and short of it is that that vase does not look out of place in any um, a neo-Georgian interior. Um, it's got all the right dimensions and it's got the right type of design but when you look closely at it it's very much um, an arts and crafts uh, design and bearing in mind that all Moorcroft pottery is hand painted then it fits very well into the ethos of, uh, of arts and crafts and that was to produce hand decorated objects. So um, the, um, the choice, the choice is yours and the, this <laughs> I won't say they're a set, uh, but you've got five vases of the same shape, um, each one with an individual design that looks as though it's absolutely perfect. Because again, William Moorcroft is is very keen to make sure that his designs complement the shapes to which they're applied. Um, and in, in this case, you've got one or two showing gilding. Now, gilding seems to have been introduced in around about 1903, um, and it seems to have disappeared for the most part by about the, the beginning of, dare I say, um, the, the, the First World War. Um, but um, the choice is entirely yours. Um, and um, um, if there's not one vase that doesn't appeal to you there, hmm, well, I think I might be suggesting you go and see your GP. But anyway, uh, as I say, I'm not here, I stress, to, to say you should be liking this stuff. But, you know, you can't ignore it. Um, and then um, there is a problem. There's a problem that's happening by 1912, 1913, and that is that James McIntyre's have decided that um, it is far more profitable uh, to make electrical switch gear for the emerging um, electric uh, lighting industry, um, which is all happening in around about uh, 19, 1910. Um, and, um, and so they, some um, clever accountant probably worked out that, you know, that the, the value per square foot in in the more in the in the McIntyre factory um, was better used for making electrical switch gear. Um, in the meantime, um, it's I think it's fair to say that William Moorcroft um, had a scenario where he didn't feel he, he was seeing eye to eye with any of uh, the management um, and looks to Liberty and Co. and they in turn um, suggest that they go into a two-third, one-third partnership, one-third obviously to William Moorcroft and um, certainly by 1914, uh, bingo, look at this, a, a state-of-the-art factory um, um, from the blueprint to being erected less than a year apparently, incredible, absolutely incredible. So come 1914, um, yes, with the war clouds uh, looming on the horizon, um, our William Moorcroft um, goes independent and, um, and the results 
of that independence are going to be seen um, in my talk number two. So catch me then. In the meantime, please remember, if you can make a donation uh, at the end of this talk, it will be gratefully received. So Eric Knowles signing off from somewhere uh, here in the Chiltern Hills, um, self-isolating like so many, and, um, and just uh, wishing you all, um, well, wishing you all um, to stay safe and to look after you and yours. Take care, everybody. Take care.